the radio ban because we sort of cut off, but that was a very, very important uh, time in, in Australian music because it actually changed the course of a lot of people's careers, didn't it? It really did. I mean, it was a, uh, a devastating time in some respects. And the, the, the interesting point about it is that Fable had signed the biggest royalty rate lease deal with Polygram worldwide that had ever been negotiated in this country. It was a massive result for us. And because Fable, uh, because Polygram did not own a pressing plant, all of their product was pressed by EMI. And EMI became very dirty on me over the fact that I wouldn't join them in the record ban. So they announced to Polygram that they would not press any Fable product. Oh, so it got really dirty. Oh, it did, yeah. <laughs> so now, and uh, I, was, I was speaking with Paul Turner, who was then the boss of Polygram, and the, but this agreement had only been in force for about a month. And we're rolling along and all of a sudden we've got, we're, instead of having a, a worldwide organisation behind us, we've got nothing behind us. Because what happened after EMI pulled the plug, they then arranged for every other record pressing plant in Australia not to manufacture Fable product. So what did you do? So I then phoned EMI New Zealand and said to the guy, can you do some 45s for me? He said, yeah, sure. So I sent the metal parts and the labels over. Two days later, I could still see, I walk in the office one morning and there's a telex on the thing. It said, have been instructed from Australia not to manufacture your product. And I thought, bloody hell, where do you go from here? I mean, we had all this product out, all this airplane. And we couldn't press them. And we had no records. So I think it was either, I'm pretty sure that Bill Armstrong had a contact with a very good pressing plant in Singapore. So I phoned up the man in Singapore and he said, sure, we're going to do it. So we were doing all this and we're getting big shipments of product coming through. How long would a shipment take then? Oh, they were pretty quick. They, were they? Uh, we'd get it through within a week. Um, and my, we, we were ordering like huge quantities of stuff. I mean, 50,000 copies of this and 25 of that and all of that kind of stuff. And we had our customs agent at Tullamarine clearing, getting the stuff cleared as quickly as possible until one day when our customs agent rang and said, uh, we've got a problem. I said, tell me about it. He said, the customs went around the parameter of the record label are the words made in Australia, just around the copyright edge of it there. Mm -hmm. And these records were made, were pressed in Singapore and the customer's refusing to release them. So he's saying that, the, he's talking about the physical pressing and you're talking about the recording yeah, so, and the made in Australia. So the argument was, I said, hey, hang on a minute. I said, the piece of vinyl on its own is worth nothing. I said, what gives it value is what's in the grooves, and what's in the grooves was made in Australia. And the customs still wouldn't wear it. So we had to get rubber stamps made and go Every over... Every copy. And this, we've got albums, and how are you going to get into the middle of an album to put a rubber stamp on without putting marks on the record itself? It was a nightmare. But you managed. We managed, and... I, I, we did about 5,000 of them, and I said, oh, the hell with the rest of them, let them go. Um, so we did that, and that, that was... Uh, the worst aspect of all of that was the fact that all of the pressing plants had ganged up, and Paul Turner explained to me, he said, when, when EMI pulled the plug on them, he went to CBS, and they said, no, 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 we don't have any capacity available. And they went to Astor and they went to Festival and they all said, sorry, we can't help you. So it was the original gang up. So eventually, it, did it just work that they realised that this pay to play was stupid? Well, initially... Because you would have been selling and they, they Yeah, we, they were selling, we were selling product. 
Um, initially, and, and, and the interesting point about it is, had, had they approached me at any other time to support in the pay for play, I would have done so. Because I believed that the broadcasting stations would had of using the best talent in the world to sell everything from meat pies to motor cars. Mm. And, uh, and I think they should pay for some of that. But at the time it was put for me, I mean, there was no way I was going to go with it. And I didn't go with it. And I think that whole attack changed the whole face of, of the way the record industry and the radio stations used to work together like that. It just fell apart because some of the radio stations were saying, if we're going to pay to play the record, you can slip it under the door. Don't bother about bringing it in because we'll make up our minds what we're going to play. And I think it just ruined the whole wonderful set of rules or unwritten rules that had been there for Lord knows how many years when you could walk into a radio station and be welcome. Uh, I... Initially, when they settled the pay-for-play thing, the broadcasters said, we'll give you airtime to advertise your product. We won't pay money. That didn't last very long. So um, what the status is now, uh, I have no idea. Neither do I. But it was a very ugly event and something that I just kind of wish had not happened. But the, the other interesting point about it is it did create a whole heap of new recording artists and people were suddenly buying Australian products. Rock down.